Um, but I am very pleased to move on to our final session of the day. Um, we're really excited to welcome our closing keynote speaker, Susanna Passman. Susanna is a professor of media studies at the University of uh, Turku. I'm trying to roll that R, not quite succeeding there, maybe. She's published prolifically across fields such as effect theory, porn studies, media studies, star studies, feminist theory, and film studies, to name but a few. Uh, and her recent publications, some of them co authored, tackle topics ranging from deep fakes to dick pics to the star image of Yul Brynner. She's also the author of books such as Carnal Resonance, Affect and Online Pornography, and Distracted, Frustrated Boards, Affective Formations in Networked Media, um, published last year. And the co-author alongside Joshua Neves, Alina Chia, and Ravi Sundaram of Technopharmacology, which the publisher's site at least suggests might be releasing this week. So very exciting for that one. Um, we were particularly keen to have Susanna here today because of her work in bringing together studies of sexuality with studies of games, play and digital cultures, um, both as co-editor of a 2021 special issue of the journal Sexualities on Play um, and through her characteristically brilliant monograph, Many Splendid Things, Thinking Sex and Play. Uh, and I know uh, Jack and I have both found her work enormously um, useful and thought provoking for our own. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're very much looking forward to this presentation, which I believe is called uh, Sex, Play and Networked Excitement. Um, so over to you, Susanna, I will... Um... Thank you, Rob. And yeah. yes, that is the title indeed. Let me... Uh, let me share. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually zooming in from Manchester, which is... <laughs> which is kind of bizarre. Um, so that's at least a break from the kind of pandemic, uh, zooming in from my kitchen, uh, which I've been doing a fair amount. Um, so th thanks for holding, holding on um, until end of day. Uh, my talk might be slightly the odd one um, out um, in the sense that I, I do many things, but I'm not a game studies scholar. Um, and I don't particularly pretend to be. But I'll be talking around um, my interest, um, as, as Rob mentioned, mentioned, at the interconnections of, of sex and, and play. Um, and basically, this is an interest um, that spanned a few years. We had a project that I was PI of, and Mayara was part of the project for a while, um, thinking about sexuality and play in media culture with the idea is, I mean, the main question was like what would happen or what we might see um, if we brought in conceptualizations of play and playfulness into studies of sex and sexuality, what might this kind of analytical route open up? And basically my interest has been revolving around this thing. So I'm not arguing that sex is play because that would kind of be stupid. Uh, it's more about bringing uh, together two fields of research that have uh, intermeshed, but not always in very intimate ways. Um, so we did a few things. We had um, a sexual cultures conference that Tom was one of the keynotes for, um, that brought together came to these uh, scholars, gender studies people, people from um, well media communications, but also sociology um, and business. And based on that event, um, we did the special issue that Rob already mentioned uh, that I edited with Caroline Bem, who was postdocing for the project. And there was also another special issue uh, that's an open access for wider screen, um, edited by uh, Velimatti uh, Karhulahti, Laura Saarema, um, and someone else, but I can't remember who that was now. But basically, um, we managed doing what we set out to do, which, which was to bring people into discussion and sort of thinking together what might happen um, at the intersections of sex and play. Um, but I'll talk more about my own kind of avenue into this and, and what my project was about. Um, and that resulted in the monograph that I published in 2018. Uh, the cover design is by Rebecca Glyn Blanco um, and I, it looks like like unicorns should pop up somewhere. I really, I really appreciate um, the aesthetics. Um, the inspiration for this uh, book, it was initially, it was supposed to be like a side project, like an article, but then I got very much um, into it, so it became a book. 
Um, and the reason I started thinking about this, basically, um, I was working on a book chapter on the films of Jan Soldat, who's a Berlin-based filmmaker, whose work largely, but not exclusively, focuses on, on queer male sexual cultures around, um, well, the broader Berlin region, but also in around Vienna more recently. And I was doing a chapter um, on a film called The Incomplete. Um, and, but I, I went through the whole catalog and the way that people spoke about uh, sex and play or sex as play, sex in terms of play, uh, really sort of grabbed me. So one of the films uh, was Coming of Age, which is about adult uh, baby play, diaper play. Um, and within that, um, the two men, it's a portrait of two men and their play practices basically says about diaper play, you know, it's like the first time it's always forced anyway, you need to work it out to see what works, what doesn't. And then the second time it's better, it's more relaxed and then it just gets better and better. And the, the other guy says, his partner says, it's like any other game. Uh, some people like it, some don't, you can't force it. It doesn't, if it either works or it doesn't, it's that simple. So this kind of formulation very much went against the kind of idea um, of sexual preferences um, as being sort of innate or kind of in the, in, the, in the vein of identity politics, you know, I'm born this way. Uh, no, it's really like, you know, you have to work it out, you have to figure it out, you experiment, and then something that comes about. And this, it's not surprising for such experimentations to be articulated um, through the notion of, of, of play, as in role play. Um, but I really found the kind of particular way in which it was done very interesting. Um, and in The Incomplete, which is a portrait um, of a gay, a gay male slave uh, without a master. Um, and basically it's a lot of kind of monologue where Klaus Johannes Wolf talks about while he's chained, self-chained to the bed. Talks in really like serious, um, way like you know our world is getting more rational everything's getting more mechanical uh, we are blocking the whole thing out the whole game the act of playing we can't play anymore as society cannot play anymore um, and the way that he he puts that uh, there's nothing kind of light or funny about it it's really like a serious matter and i got really kind of interested in in how this whole framing of sex through the notion of play and sexuality, through the notion of playfulness, um, actually works against kind of binary forms of thinking. Um, actually, work and play don't become, uh, they don't form a binary um, kind of like sense of, of fun uh, doesn't cancel out the seriousness. So something else is opened up. And since I'm, I'm very nerdy, I went to one of these rabbit holes um, and I really started thinking like there must be these bodies of literature that bring together um, studies of, of sexuality, which is sort of my field, but I thought, I just don't know about these bodies of research, it happens. We can never read it all. Um, and then I started asking around uh, um, among my, my game studies friends, like in terms of like the bodies of literature that are doing this. Um, and it really didn't, um, and it turned out there really wasn't much that was doing conceptual work. So there were these snippets around the place, um, like Lauren Bellant's um, bit when she's discussing um, sex scandal um, and basically asking, she's not answering the question, but she's asking what would happen if people were encouraged to enjoy sex as play rather than as drama, uh, rather than as this kind of like question of, ident question of either um, identity or recognition of identity or an issue of control um, linked to identity. And I started thinking like what in fact might follow. Um, and then I spend a fair amount of time, fair amount of time in this particular um, rabbit hole. Um, so when it comes to so-called classic theories of play, um, there really isn't much. In fact, it's the case uh, as has been pointed out by others um, that sex um, tends to actually mark the boundary uh, of where play ends. So it's, it's an area of, of kind of like borderline and then across the border kind of a zone. I mean, Heisinger, for example, it's not surprising that somebody writing in 1940 
Nine uh, will understand sex in terms of reproduction and copulation. Uh, but basically in his kind of like, there's kind of a, I'm not sure if it's a taxonomical logic, but a bit, um, argues that, that the biological pairing, process of pairing doesn't um, answer the formal characteristics of play in the sense that it's not autotelic, that there's other purpose, which means uh, love play as biological process of reproduction and copulation. Um, and then play nevertheless can be the realm of the far out there. So erotic relationships falling outside the social norm. Um, the formulation um, some decades later in Kalua is not actually that different. Um, and I found that really interesting, like what's going on here, um, because it seemed to me like there was much that could be done uh, at this conjuncture. Um, yet the general move had been to ply these, uh, pry these things apart in very um, uncertain, I mean, in very certain terms. That was interesting. Now, of course, in, in the realm of uh, kink cultures, uh, the notion of play is broadly used to connote scenes um, of well sexual play, sexual encounters. I mean, this ranges from party and play, chem sex sessions uh, to, to BDSM sessions uh, with kind of pre-prescribed pre roles. Um, it also extends to kind of what, what some people in sociology call leisure sex. I find that term really bizarre, <laughs> like as a concept, I don't, I don't get it. Um, but in the realm of, of um, kind of like, um, like hobby sex, as in sex toys, um, as in, well, publications such as Playboy, of course, have been framing sex in terms of play for a long time, but this kind of, um, kind of like extracurricular fun sex has been very much framed in terms of play, but it really hasn't been Oh, I'll take that away so I don't knock it. Um, it really hasn't been conceptualized on those terms. Um, within studies of sexuality, um, um, play emerges in studies of BDSM and kink, um, and also in relation to childhood sex claim games, uh, role-playing games. Uh, so those are basically two areas where it's, um, it's kind of key. Um, but there's also a tendency in sexology actually to do a similar boundary uh, move as happens in Heisinger um, in that um, in framing sexuality through, uh, through uh, reproductive terms. And of course it's, it's extremely heteronormative, um, but it's also blind, I think, to how people, uh, how people do sexuality and how rare an occasion uh, reproductive aims for sexuality might be. Um, it, it's, it's, I mean, the whole kind of like imagination around sex, I find it kind of bizarre. But in sexology, um, it's um, for a long time, there's been its balancing between this kind of understanding of sex as this biological impulse, impulse to reproduce, um, and then the difficult thing that has to do with desire and pleasure going way beyond such confines. So as I started thinking about interconnections of sex and play, um, I, I came across or read uh, Mikhail Sikart's Play Matters, um, which I really thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, and in the introduction, he writes about play uh, or the need to not conflate play uh, with the notion of fun um, and arguing that, that we should really frame it in terms of pleasure instead, but not just pleasure as this kind of like fun and games thing, but rather um, as a complex issue that is not, as he writes, submissive to enjoyment, happiness or positive traits. Um, that play can be uh, pleasurable when it hurts, offends, challenges, teases us, or even when we're not playing. So somebody else's games might, you know, um, have an impact on us. And he writes, let's not talk about play as fun, but as pleasurable, opening us to the immense variations of pleasure in the world. Um, and this um, kind of became something of a light motif for the book project, even as, as Sicard elsewhere in the book repeats the move of actually framing out sex. Uh, from the realm of play, um, which was kind of interesting. But I started really inspired by his book. Um, I started thinking about playfulness as this mode or capacity, orientation of openness, experimentation, curiosity, that then motivates uh, play as acts um, of experimentation. So the actualization of playfulness. 
So carrying out different scenarios uh, and under more or less clearly defined sets of rules and guidelines. Um, and this happens differently in different kinds of scenes of play, but this was my sort of take on those notions. And then I really started thinking about what this allows us to see. Um, and that, be, that basically is the framing question of that book. Da da, I think it allows us really uh, to foreground pleasure, um, which I think is an under theorized concept um, outside the realm of psychoanalytical theory. And I do not work within psychoanalytical theory. Let's make that clear. I may be a child of 90s academia, but I do not work with psychoanalytical theory. Um, so actually for me, um, for me, uh, the framework of both um, conceptualizations of play and then affect theory um, where ways of, of finding different points of entrance into thinking about sexuality, desire, and pleasure that don't start from the kind of realm of lack, which is basically uh, Freud and Lacan. Um, and let's not even go to the gendered ramifications of that. Um, but in, in addition to foregrounding pleasure, I think what happens is that materiality of bodies becomes foregrounded. Um, and I think this is the thing that then might be valuable to game studies or studies of games and play more broadly. This kind of, of course, this is what this event has been doing, especially um, in the presentations. I wasn't able to attend the whole day because I had to relocate within Manchester. Um, but I think bringing that understanding of the materiality of bodies um, as, as they are impacted by the bodies they encounter in the world, both human and non-human, in a very kind of broadly Spinozan terms, um, I think that can be very valuable to how um, play is conceptualized and how we sort of understand um, the kind of impetus or motivation for play and the value of play um, as something that generates pleasure. But not just the fun and games kind of pleasure, but also this kind of more, more strained, more dark, more complex um, sense of enjoyment. Um, and I also think that this um, allows us to foreground the effect of um, effect of excitement, and I'll say a few words about that as in just a moment. Um, and but really here, I think it's important here to keep in mind, mind Sicard's uh, point um, on the kind of importance of holding on to um, to um, more ambiguous or broader spectrum of affect uh, when we're talking about pleasure. Um, so that, let's say, I mean, in the realm of, even if, well, a bit of Freud, um, I think just thinking about sexuality, how desire might be amplified by, let's say, shame or disgust. I mean, I would say conceptualizations of, of sexual desire um, have always entailed this effective complexity. Um, but I think pushing that slightly further, um, I think what then follows is really the importance of non-binary forms of thinking, of really foreground, foregrounding ambiguity, the logic of both and. And this is not generally something that cultural theory does well, if at all. Um, there tends to be this kind of seduction to much firmer narratives um, and, and firmer, kind of firmer arguments, and that's understandable in this kind of business that we are in. Um, but I think and I've been obsessed actually recently, not so much with the notion of play at this point, but with the notion of ambiguity. Um, really thinking about like holding on to uh, contradictory meanings um, and not doing away with the tensions that cut through them. And also, I mean, broadly following Derrida, also thinking about how um, terms that might seem mutually opposing actually constitute one another. Uh, this kind of form of thinking that is not about either or, but about both and. And sorry, that's maybe a little heavy a thing for the last thing of the day. Anyway, done with that now. Um, so within sex, if we think about in terms of, of play, uh, all kinds of games obviously take place. People get played, um, rules uh, agreed upon, get rules that have been agreed upon get broken. All kinds of violence does happen, and I think um, the whole Me Too movement that came about um, as I was actually writing the book um, has made that starkingly evident on the level of public discourse as well. 
uh, one person's play may well be another person's work. And this is regularly the case in the realm of sex as the previous uh, session just showed. So play isn't merely a merry thing, but it does involve an autotelic um, quest uh, for pleasure. So I think we can understand play as an autotelic practice of pleasure. We just need to think of the pleasure then as a complex thing. Um, and in terms of studies of sexuality, um, foregrounding uh, play also means foregrounding experimentation. Um, it's something that Jonathan Bolland and David McInnes a while ago wrote about as an erotics of unpredictability. And I really like that phrase, mainly that you never know before you play, you never know what's gonna happen. You're, you can never fully know what you might enjoy um, until there has been kind of an encounter where you then figure it out. Um, so for me, uh, bringing conceptualizations of uh, play into studies of sexuality then help to think about how tastes um, come about and how they alter as we live and as we experiment and as we encounter different bodies in the world, how likes and dislikes uh, become formed, how they might get transformed um, and how discoveries and experiment, I mean, discoveries through experimentations um, then change our notion of the sexual self. And these experimentation, I mean, these discoveries can be very minor or they can be major. So there, there can be a drama of a turn as in a sexual turning from this to that, um, or more minor kind of realization of what we might like and what we like now might be a different thing from what we liked, let's say 20 years ago, in my case, since I am middle-aged or what I might like in 20 years if I'm still, if I'm still with you in 20 years. So one of the, um, in my, I've been working on affect theory for a long time. Um, I mean, at first, I mean, 20 years ago, I, when I started, I really, I had, I had no sense of anything. I have a sense of some things, um, but I wouldn't say I'm necessarily like an expert on all areas of it. But I've been very um, interested in work of Sylvan Tompkins. Um, his, Overall conceptualization of affect has been broadly critiqued um, for its taxonomical uh, kind of purposes. Um, but I like the general ethos of the work. And there's a sentence that I came across as I was working on the book uh, where he writes, I am a ball, what excites me? Now it's taken from um, a bit where he writes about, um, let's say someone who loves music um, loves playing music, is a musician because the music excites him. Um, or, you know, someone who loves sports um, is either, you know, becomes an athlete or then a sports lover. So basically it's about how identities are formed through our attachments to objects in the world or, or phenomena in the world. So let's say a nerdy researcher such as myself might be a researcher because we get excited by very nerdy things, concepts. It's very exciting stuff. Um, and I really started then thinking about maybe not as the kind of idea of identity that I am this one thing, but of identity about being excited by multiple things at the same time that might be mutually exclusive um, and how these kind of excitements, both minor and major and, and something in between, um, then constantly transform um, how we are and what we are in the world. And this and then it's a kind of a process of becoming and unbecoming at the same time. That's not just kind of pleasurable um, in, the, in the like, oh, so nice kind of sense. It can also be uh, painful. It can also be traumatic. But the point is that things don't remain the same. Um, they shift and vary because desire is an unruly thing um, as our fantasies. And also I, mean, I would say that play in the realm of sexuality it's also unpredictable in how bodies seek out and find their pleasures. So one of the things, and I'm not gonna talk forever, in fact, I'm not gonna talk for very long at all. Um, in the kind of, let's say pre-pandemic, we are not post-pandemic yet probably, um, but for the last, let's say five years, there's been, um, increasing move towards the deplatforming of sex uh, from social media platforms, um, but also different kinds of campaigns or crusades um, against online pornography. Um, and a lot of my work 
recently has revolved well around the star image of your Brunner, which is, yeah, it is what it is. Um, but I've been really working a lot on uh, content moderation, um, kind of the, the principles, the politics of that issue of sexual rights uh, pertaining to the uh, ousting of sex from online platforms and basically the whole, the whole rationale or the lack of rationale. So um, my bit in the technopharmacology book that is just out, um, I think Tuesday, um, it's also coming up on open access on Mason Press. Um, I don't know when, but soonish, but it's not on their site yet. Uh, so my bit is basically on diagnosis of porn addiction, uh, online porn addiction, looking at the whole kind of like figure of addiction uh, and arguing uh, for a kind of more nuanced understanding of excitements and dependencies um, that make the self uh, outside this kind of, um, kind of like, uh, yeah, outside the discourse of addiction, basically. I'm not at my most articulate today. Um, but what's happening is basically, uh, we have a framing of online porn as the new drug uh, that then requires uh, kind of public health measures. So porn has been declared a public health emergency um, in something like more than 12 US states uh, that never occurred with the HIV epidemic. Um, and of course, once COVID started to happen, um, the idea of, um, of porn as, as the public health crisis uh, started to seem a bit bizarre. Um, but there's also the kind of addiction discourses building on neuroscientific uh, research or particular interpretations of neuroscientific research, framing it as this you know, addictive substance uh, that then spreads in viral ways and leads to this public health crisis situation. Um, and these campaigns are done by um, kind of right wing uh, Christian groups in the US, conservative lobbying groups uh, and anti-porn feminists in, in this kind of unholy alliance. Um, but something like NoFap, which is um, more manosphere kind of formation um, that has been studied a lot recently. Um, it builds on similar notion of, of addiction uh, aiming to free fappers uh, from their from their seedy ways towards more and to increase their masculinity uh, in the process, because in this formulation, porn makes straight men more feminine, and it's also a gateway to them becoming gay, because once you look at penises on the screen, you know it might lead to things. Sorry, I digress, but there is this kind of like whole framing of of risk and harm as in a public health crisis around online porn, whereas online porn is seldom defined in this era of webcamming, in this era of, of multi, multiple multi-platform sexual practices, and in the framework of the pandemic in particular, where people have been moving online because that's been a safer way to practice sex. Um, I mean, this is just an example of the ousting of sex from social media platforms in the kind of ephemeral name of safety. So to give us safe, um, you can't have, you can't have um, uh, female presenting breasts, for example, unless it's a case of, um, unless it's just a case of uh, cancer or lactation or breastfeeding. Um, lactation in a sexual context wouldn't be okay, or then protest. Um, and then at the same time with COVID, we got this kind of surge um, in public uh, health officials, not arguing that porn, online porn comprises a public health crisis, but rather arguing that it might you know, serve as solutions. Uh, sexy Zoom parties, I know that's a bit of an oxymoron, but they did happen uh, during the lockdowns in particular. So what I think in this framework, that is really uh, the discursive framework that is so much about addiction, it's about harm, it's about trauma, um, it's really about this kind of like lack of agency. It's, you know, what mediated images of sex are doing to us um, on levels both individual and collective, and it's nothing good. That's, <laughs> that's to spoil the surprise. Um, to think of networked practices of pleasure, whether it's a sexy Zoom party or whether it is sexting, um, or whether it's a webcam session, uh, whether it's actually shooting a porn clip, through the notion of play as not something that precludes seriousness um, or even 
working around trauma might be part of it does not exclude work in any shape or form, but basically as these experimentations with what bodies can do, um, and also consumption of, of, these, of such content, although in the, in the contemporary moment, I don't think we can really tell apart like the production and consumption of, of mediated sexual content. And hence, I think actually we need a new vocabulary to talk about porn, uh, which is a different matter. But it basically opens up a different analytical lens um, that's more about improvisation and discovery without doing away with all the crap that may happen in sexual encounters and in realms of, of commercial sex, also in the realms of non-commercial sex. Um, so basically what this thinking of sex through the notion of play might then help would be uh, to circumvent or find alternatives for um, this framework of governance and, and risk, which I can't see being very productive um, in terms of either platform governance or either governing um, the kind of uh, governing sexual lives of people through notions of normalcy or abnormalcy or health or risk or anything such. Sorry, I'm, I'm really, uh, there's a cat. Um, so I'm distracted, which makes this the perfect <laughs> uh, time probably uh, to stop. The cat is very cute. Actually, there are two cats. So thank you for thank you for holding on till the last thing. And let's do something a bit more interactive now. Thanks, Susanna. That was um, fantastic. And um, yeah, called back in all sorts of ways to the last panel, but also to conversations that have been going on all day, uh, including where the kind of affect that we might talk about as cultural theorists intersects with the kind of affect that people designing biometric systems designed to uh, measure arousal and va valence, et cetera, uh, meet, which I, I guess is also the Sylvan Tompkins zone. How can you kind of, um, can you kind of quantify or classify the stuff or does it remain ineffable? So yeah, I, people want to, raise hands then do so um there are some comments in the chat i'm gonna grab hosts privilege while i can and while people might still be formulating comments to ask a question about games and play which is another sort of a hoary old chestnut of some of those mid-century books about um play uh, and this idea that um maybe play is more freeform and improvising possibly even autotelic and maybe games are yes. more formalized and rule bound and I think there's all sorts of ways that we can and should uh, deconstruct that but I wondered whether it was helpful in um, thinking about um, the difference between say the kinds of case studies Tom's looking at where you have these menus of acts that people are selecting from and buying presumably with the assumption that they know what they want and they just want that versus the kinds of more open-ended freeform play you're talking about because it seems like one is quite rule bounds one is more um performative more playful does does that feel like a useful distinction yeah it's it's a difficult one like where does one end and the other one begin um because if you think of like let's say a scene of kink play uh certain rules will be you know pre-agreed upon soft boundaries hard boundaries uh, roles, props, I mean, there's a whole kind of like, um, um, like in a way, um, rules are being set, so you can almost have this magic circle kind of thing around something like a dungeon, I mean, easily translates as one. Um, but then in practices of play, um, there is this kind of like experimentation uh, and discovery um, that isn't pre-agreed upon, because it's the, it's the realm of experimentation, so it's not even if you would agree on a certain kind of like script, it's not, never gonna be repeated identically. It's always gonna be something else because of how the partners are, what the situation is, how they are sort of feeling um, and how things just feel in that particular moment. So even if it would be kind of like gamified in that sense, like, you know, this is what we're gonna do and this is, these are the rules and we shall follow the rules. And then, you know, this will be the outcome or the outcome is what it is. Um, there's the kind of like unruliness to it in the sense of experimentation in terms of, you know, to go a little butler on you, like repetitions are never identical. It's always gonna be something else that, that then happens. Um, yeah, but I think when it comes to um, kind of monetization of sex, the kind of menu bound logic uh, tends to dominate in any case because it is basically 
equivalent to buying a service or buying a commodity. Um, that doesn't mean that um, one can know the commodity beforehand. It might be something that you haven't ordered. So it is surprising always. Um, and I'm hoping that I don't come across as kind of like romanticizing the notion of, of play. I think um, I haven't really been working through the notion of game so much. I mean, in some of the examples I analyze, yes. Um, in, because the book is basically, it's, it's, it's about media. Because I'm a media studies scholar, so examples are all about media. Um, so I wouldn't say that play is like this realm of kind of like, you know, freedom and, and then other stuff happens. But I think it sneaks in into, into all kinds of practices of, of even, you know, something that is defined as a game. But it's, it's tricky, I mean, in terms of like, you know, analytically, like where, where does one end and the other one begin? I'm also aware I'm one of the few monolingual people in a very multilingual panel and that that games play distinction works differently or doesn't exist in some different languages. But yeah. I see a couple of raised hands. Uh, Fong, would you would you like to pose a question? Um, yeah, but I think Jack was before me. Well, Jack, would you like to pose a question? Let's, um, let's uh, keep to protocol. <laughs> Thanks, Susanna. That was so interesting. I just, I was particularly, I did write about digital role play in online games. And when you said like sex marks a boundary where play ends, it just made me think like, I, I write about like the inherent eroticisms of, of, of play, um, but I don't actually talk about erotic role play, uh, yeah. which is the specific practice of um, engaging in sex in doing digital role play. But that wasn't my question. Um, that was just a thought. But my question was, um, about you talking about the the no fap menosphere video games it's sort of like a venn diagram that is a is a circle and i wanted to think about uh talk uh christopher mcmahon talked earlier about um video games sort of providing male players with sexy bodies um to consume or engage with and i was like what was your thoughts on like this intersection between like not no porn but also being surrounded by porn constantly in, in video games, in, in the media that you consume? Thanks, Jack. That's an excellent question. Yes, I mean, I, I was actually, one of the people I was very much inspired by was Jakob Stenros, who's actually, who's, have, I mean, has been doing a lot of stuff around uh, role playing um, and actually writes in interesting ways at the intersections of, of sex and, and play. But he's one of the, I mean, in his PhD work. Um, so that was one of the gems I found in the early on. Um, so there, there is definitely stuff. Yeah, I think um, it's my sense um, that some of the kind of, um, how would I say that, um, anonymity uh, towards uh, porn and commercial sex, and in particular towards female sex workers, um, because this kind of extends to, um, to, to kind of like um, pushing for banning of, of pole dancers from social media. So, I mean, there's kind of like an incelly thing around um, the uh, deplatforming of sex, um, which then becomes about the deplatforming of, of female, of, of basically female bodies engaged in commercial sex, very broadly construed from pole dancing to, to um, kind of direct sex work. Um, and there's a sense that these women uh, kind of reap benefits at the expense of straight men. Um, and then the kind of power relations become reversed in unpleasant ways. Um, so basically um, the men become um, taken advantage of. Um, so whereas in, in, in kind of traditional critiques of porn, it's, it's seen that, I mean, in kind of like traditional uh, anti-porn feminist things, it's porn is seen as this kind of apparatus of male power or female bodies, kind of like exploitation of women. In, in NoFap discourse, actually it's exploitation, exploitation of the men who are, you know, um, paying for stuff or allured by these images um, and can't, you know, they, can, they can't get the ideal, they have to pay for the simulacrum. So in that sense, games uh, with digitally manufactured bodies, I mean, that's kind of like a perfect solution to this question of like who benefits on the, on the level of labor. Um, it might not do help in doing away with the fapping as such, um, but there's definitely this kind of like, a, a kind of the political economy critique in a way into, into the no fap. Um, that's basically just about who reaps the, the, the profits um, 
so so I think that that sense games would make perfect sense actually. And for all that some of those spaces are steeped in gamer culture, there's a similar antipathy sometimes to games as this unproductive expenditure of your effort that's just serving these corporations and you could be doing something more masculine. So it's, yeah, interesting, yeah. Uh, this addictive commodity. Um, Fung, so yeah, uh, you're next now. What did you want yeah. to say? Hi, um, thanks for a really interesting talk, Susanna. Um, I, I enjoyed your emphasis on uh, non-binary forms of thinking. Um, and I wondered if you could say something about um, the sort of philosophical frame or way that we might have for making sense of things when we try to maybe uh, think in terms of what comes first and what comes second, and what has priority. Um, for example, I'm thinking about the Sylvan Tompkins quote, you know, I am above all what excites me and maybe one way of reading that is to think about how sort of fantasy comes before the habits and then sort of shapes an individual to uh, to be more inclined or disinclined I mean that may of course be an erroneous uh, reading because it sort of then is it according priority to one thing over another um, so could you say something about how we can sort of uh, steer ourselves away from maybe you know rigid philosophical frameworks that might be inclined to do that and then sort of stick with ambiguity and fluidity and so on and how we can still make sense of things. Thank you, I'll, I'll try. Um, I basically, I went back to um, to Derrida's notion of the pharmacon um, as, you know, a pharmacon, the Greek work for drugs, that is both the drug, the cure and the toxin. So it's, it's both toxic and curative at the same time. And as he writes, there is no, there is no uh, pharmacon that's just kind of like uh, positive in its outcomes. It's always gonna be both and. Um, and he uses the pharmacon um, to basically, uh, well, deconstruct since that was his thing, uh, the logic of the either or that it's both and, and you have to think of these two things in, in tandem and also to see like how they give one rise to another. And I really, became kind of interested in, in, and it's easier said than done. I, I will admit that in critical analysis, but um, I did a book, um, The Effective Formations uh, in Network Media, where I'm basically looking at kind of boredom as tied to interest and excitement so that it's not a binary. It's more like they, it's about kind of oscillations in effective intensity or thinking about distraction and attention, not as polar opposites but attention, what attention as, um, or let's say distraction as the reorientation of attention. It's about intensities of experience, it's about scales, it's about temporalities. Um, and also thinking of dependence, uh, not in terms of addiction, let's say dependence on network media for how, the, for how everyday life uh, works and which has become kind of clear with the pandemic um, has been tied in with agency, how you know dependence and agency don't cancel each other out. We are always dependent on different kinds of infrastructures. We're dependent on many things. Um, so, to, so to kind of have this logic of, of both and, and the reason I wanted to do that was that in kind of studies of social media in particular, there is this kind of dystopian romanticism, you know, that we can't focus, uh, we can't remember, we can't socialize, it's been ruined. Oh, it's awful, let me write about how awful it is. Um, and I don't think that does justice to the richness um, of everyday life. So this kind of macro level critiques of, of data capitalism, they do away with the stuff, the excitements that make the self and make the, and kind of like that make things matter in the sense of adding effective intensity to everyday life. So also thinking of the scales of the macro and the micro uh, together when we're doing kind of um, analysis of digital media, I think that's crucial. It doesn't mean that, you know, critiques of let's say data capitalism um, or, whatever you want to call it, wouldn't be acutely important. It just means that we need to hold on to the other stuff and we need to think about how, how the, um, well, let's call it effect here, but not in the effect studies paradigm, how the effect of any, um, any devices or apps or platforms are going to be, they're going to be diverse and they're going to be both toxic and curative most likely at the same time. Um, I mean, and that's a, that's kind of a, that's what Derrida basically writes about mm. going, going way, you know, to Plato's pharma, pharmacy and all that stuff about um, 
how when writing was formed, there was complaints around, you know, kind of memory functions uh, being lost because you can write it down, you don't have to memorize. So it was this story of erosion. And if you think of writing as like the first form of media in that sense, or kind of like one, one of the first forms of media, it started out as this story of erosion and loss. And we're still kind of partly caught up in that. Um, yeah, but what comes first and what follows, I think within that logic, they are, they coexist so that the one mm. does not come before the other. Um, I think in in, Sol in Tomkins's excitements, it's that like we become redone all the time or reshuffled somehow in an encounters with the world. Although some excitements and attachments, of course, will they will carry us through. Like there will be passions that that last a lifetime, and then there's like stuff that comes and goes and lasts a certain while. Um, so yeah, I think there's a different kind of temporality or kind of like order to. Tompkins, because he was a psychologist, so uh, for him, the kind of the individual definitely exists, the excitements. Um, but then how that those excitements happen is, is a complex thing. They can be by accident. They can be, you know, kind of like fantasies, knowingly developed, um, multiple things. So those two, two aspects of Sylvan's of sort of relying on categories, but then also those aspects that you, you particularly admire. Um, would you yeah. sort of see it as a sort of critique through complexity then, rather than a critique through, say, forming a, a counter discourse to things which might be problematic, like um, those forms of risk and, and government assessment that you talked about, um, rather than forming a kind of um, counter discourse that one can point to quite easily with sort of identified terms about how, for example, habits relates to fantasy and how that relates to power and so on. It's a sort of, you know, a rejection of that, which in it in and of itself may solidify and sort of then, uh, you know, not uh, uh, be part of the non-binary thinking and so, so sort of still make that claim to power um, in, a, in a sort of problematic way. Yeah, I mean, I think Eve Sedgwick had a really good point when a while back when she was writing um, about kind of thinking alongside rather than thinking against. So, so bringing more, more kind of perspectives and voices into the mix. Um, and then these perspectives and voices can, they can help us to see the thing differently. And they also frame some of the dominant discourses. Of course, her point was about cultural theory. Um, they also help to frame that differently. Um, mm. and, and I mean, I grew very tired in the nineties towards the form of critique that you know takes a cultural object and shows how it's wrong, <laughs> you know this kind of like, um, you know the deconstruction without the reconstruction part, um, which is what I grew up doing, and I really, I haven't had much interest in doing that for a long time, um, because it's also about acknowledging the fact that we can never know. It's about the limits of our knowledge uh, of the kind of part. I mean, to Haraway, it's about to our partial perspectives. Um, so it's also not claiming to understand it all. It's more about maybe to follow Foucault, the, to present the problematics in a, in a, in a certain way. Mm. Um, and I think that's more, it's more inviting to dialogue and it's more in, about inviting people to sort of think alongside and, and, and with you rather than against. And I think it's also about the kind of academic cultures that we wanna, we wanna live in and develop. So I think there's also for me a very selfish kind of aim in that. Thanks very much. And I'm very keen to get to groups with Sedgwick and their interest in Buddhism and so on. But, yeah, Thank you, Feng. So we, we did, I think, have a raised hand from Tom, but perhaps no longer. Um, but if, um, if you didn't have a question you want to pose, Tom, we have one from, from Dean who says, uh, really interesting thinking with sex through the lens of play. You mentioned briefly about how COVID has impacted sex practice and a lot of research indicates that guidelines uh, such as the UK government first limiting sex to those that share a household, then later expanding this to include those in household bubbles leads to stigmatization because it becomes something that makes people uncomfortable to think about. Um, do we, in focusing on this aspect, lose sight of the playful ways in which individuals and groups uh, got, get around restric restrictions um, and lists web chat, 3D sex games, breaching lockdowns, increases in public sex, moving in with partners to count as one household, et cetera. Um, so yeah, COVID, sex and play. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Um, 
I think I would say yes. <laughs> that would be my that would be my my answer. Um, and actually, um, the the cats here belong to um, Ben Light, who's my co-author for the Not Safe for Work book. Um, and they're currently doing a project with uh, John Mercer and Jamie Hakim on uh, focusing on gay male uh, COVID cultures. And I saw some of the data um, just um, yesterday. It's really fascinating. And it really is, um, it really is about um, sexual practices during COVID uh, with a fair amount of, of, um, um, of uh, study participants. And they are basically talking about you know what they have been doing and what they haven't been doing and for what reasons and it is full i mean it, it, it is full of playfulness both in terms of the kind of like arrangement practices getting around the rules but also just in ways that things get articulated um just even how the whole response kind of questionnaire is responded to uh, so this is to to advertise the forthcoming research that's going to be fabulous but they're just moving into data analysis now but answer, to answer to a question, yes, um, if we're focusing on that aspect, we are doing away uh, with the play. But then again, that I think that happens, especially in discourses of public uh, health. Uh, it's not known for foregrounding um, playfulness. I mean, um, what's now the, the McIntyre and whatever, God, what's his name? Um, Two Australians who did write um, early 2000s, I think, um, in the framework of, of kind of playfulness, um, talking about public health. And Kath Albury has been doing that a little, but it's not really, it's not really, um, I would say that's um, undeveloped. Um, and definitely thinking about the Finnish con context, it's kind of undeveloped as a tactic uh, in any kind of public health measure. Because we're always very serious. Sex is always such a serious matter, an issue of identity and trauma and governance and violence and self-fulfillment. And it is, but because it's both and, it is also this kind of ludic thing. And if we do away with that, then I think that would be a loss. On that topic of um, governance, and I, I guess it's uh, possible that this might also be something that um, Tom and others from that panel want to want to pick up on you, you mentioned the fact that if um, individuals change in terms of what they like what they don't like what they can stand what they look for um, platforms are quite plastic too that they're perpetually having their content policies rewritten that um, as attitudes change or as questions arise they kind of redraw those boundaries so I, I wondered if um, that might be interesting to talk about and all the relationships between different platforms that people might um, present themselves across. Uh, it seemed like Facebook figured particularly in, in the research you've been doing. Yeah, I guess it's such a market leader. But I mean, the same terms of use apply to Instagram. I mean, all of Meta's things. Um, yeah, I mean, it's partly about, I wouldn't say it's so much about changes in attitudes. It's been changes in legislation in the US, so the foster sesta laws of 2018 um, that are basically intended to curb trafficking, but they are basically to curb commercial sex. Um, and, and for the first time, they made platforms liable as publishers for the content that users post. So that has basically led to a huge tightening um, of community standards and terms of use. Um, I mean, thinking of what happened to Tumblr, like I still can't almost speak about it it's 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 the stuff of trauma uh the cleansing operation um of all the sexual cultures on tumblr um yeah it's it's basically and also sex really is it's hard to monetize um if you think of social i mean the customers of social media are the advertisers and all commercial media sells audiences to advertisers i mean in that sense um just the way it happens on social media is a bit more specific but it's very specific but basically advertisers don't want their commercial messages placed next to certain kind of content. Hence, although that content might get a lot of views and attention, it, it can't be monetized that easily. Um, so it's that interest um, that then drives what goes um, and basically what is led to. And TikTok isn't much better. <laughs> it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's the same. Um, so it's led to this idea of social media um, where sociability is void of sexuality. 
Um, and I've argued with my colleagues that this is basically a problem in terms of sexual rights, if we think of sexual rights as human rights, and I think we should. Um, so but we're left with Twitter um, that allows, uh, that's, very, that's then key to many sex workers um, kind of public presentation and Reddit, it depends if you understand it as social media or you know, whether it fits the taxonomy um, or not. So trans yes, platforms do transform, but when it comes to social media, it really has been this increase in tightening of the screw. Um, and given that the foster sister law packages, they passed the, the Senate, I think with one vote against. Um, so a rare moment of bipartisan agreement um, that then impacts everyone uh, globally. Um, I can't really see that that would particularly change. But then of course, we've been doing this project with Jenny Sunden and Katrin Tiedenberg, looking at sexual platforms um, in Sweden, Estonia and Finland. And we've been interviewing people on those platforms about precisely how they move across the kind of like promiscuous travel of users across platforms. Um, and you know whether the social setting let's say um, on a naked uh, image gallery um, site or the swingers platform, whether that scales into something like Facebook or LinkedIn, most likely it won't, but like, you know, how they manage and how they valorize uh, forms of sociability across platforms. And it's, it's actually quite interesting, uh, the direct comparisons that are made and then hookup apps can become part of that thing like part of the mix, like on, let's say on Tinder, you can't really express yourself, your, your likes, but you can share the link where then, you know, your potential partner can see your likes. And then, you know, when you move to first name basis, do you actually move on to, you know, becoming like Facebook friends, which is then, that's like a commitment. Um, so users, I mean, absolutely users do uh, make use of multiple platforms, but then there is also the sense that, people's multi-platform existence is curbed and, and shadow banning or, and actual banning of sex workers would be uh, a prime example of this. So if you have an OnlyFans account and you have a TikTok account where you don't go against community standards, you might be dancing in your pajamas, um, still you might get, actually the account might get shut down just because that body performing is associated, associated with commercial sex and hence become a sign of commercial sex and hence obscene or offensive uh, according to the terms of use. And this has happened um, with Instagram as well, similar things. So it, the cross-platform existence is it's far more precarious for certain people than others, which of course then, I mean, that's obvious, just stating the obvious. So, so would, your, would your sense be when you talk about this discourse of risk that captures it in terms of um, threats to the individual's mental health or of addiction or of trafficking, that that's in many cases a slightly disingenuous way of articulating what's actually a risk to the company's ad revenue or a sense of legal liability, meaning that they have to kind of be more conservative on what they can allow. Well, I mean, I think like thinking of the um, Hacking and Hustling Collective have done really excellent work looking at the uh, impact of banning. I mean, they started with the back page banning of sex worker advertising, and then it's scaled into foster sister because it's a part of the same process. Um, and basically um, arguing not just that it's a, it's a failed law, but it's, and it's not about, because it conflates all sex work with trafficking. Um, so that alone, uh, it's not a particularly good starting point for policy, um, but then it has ramifications for all kinds of sexual sociability. So for example, on, on, um, on Facebook, you know, if I would be, if I would be asking people to have sex with me, I would be soliciting and my, you know, account could be permanently removed uh, because I would be, you know, trafficking myself. I don't know, something, you know, bad would happen. At the same time, Facebook runs like a dating thing. So it's kind of like the economy, but it's monetized in a different way. Um, so I think, I think definitely they, there's a question of like crappy lawmaking that's driven by very particular impulses in US culture. Um, and then there is how the kind of question of platforms, they prefer to moderate, kind of over moderate rather than under moderate because the risks of over moderating means like few users will be pissed off, but that, that really doesn't count because they have how many billion users. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not like a risk, but if 
let's say a major company that uses the platform but advertises becomes you know pissed off then that has completely different consequences um so it's about the kind of like again the scale of like what a user means and then what a corporate entity as a user or a customer means in that platform and then how this kind of like legal framework comes about, which is not to say that Facebook would have been particularly friendly towards sexual content before Foster and Sesta, it really was not. Um, and the reason for that, um, it is the idea of community standards, you know, uh, keeping it safe and clean for women and children. Um, although children aren't allowed on the platform and many women actually might enjoy sexual content to my knowledge. But it's, it's really this kind of patronizing understanding and the whole notion of community standard. Um, it implies that if, if something is offensive to an average person in a community, then it has to go. But how do you define an average person on a, on a platform that has like what, 3 billion users or something ridiculous? You can't, it's always gonna be offensive to someone. And there are many things I see on a daily basis that I find deeply offensive have nothing to do with sexuality. So yes, but I've, I mean, talking about safe, you know, safety and risk in very abstract terms, um, and because sex is associated with this risk um, as sensitive content in the G, in, in kind of GDPR legislation, it sort of scales um, this kind of like sense that it's, it's touchy, it's feely, um, and, and brings about this vulnerability that is intimate in a way that brings about vulnerability, um, whereas I really think that when we think about mediated intimacies and network intimacies, we need to uncouple this understanding that sex is always intimate, like just redo that whole logic actually. And that would be helpful for sex workers as well. Not to argue that their work can't be intimate, just that this kind of like idea of what makes particular vulnerability, um, there's kind of like something toxic, I think, at the heart of the whole construction. But that just is me, it's just That's me. That's so interesting in, in terms of your discussion of how those contingent encounters can change what we might think of as offensive and how something that might strike us that way we might develop a habit for. And in terms of your uh, discussions of uh, dependency and agency and how in certain cases users can only be seen as being compelled or duped rather than as choosing something freely. So I, I'm, I'm loath to, to waffle too much. Um, are there other questions that people have? Um, did anyone else have a, a question for Susanna? Um, if not, just, uh, yeah, really fantastic um, way to, to end the day. Um, really helpful in terms of um, expanding the scope out of the games industry and video games, which we focus more on in some panels and into something that I think um, is part of part of all, all of our lives really um so uh yeah thank you so much if i could just ask everyone so yeah join us in virtually clapping our keynote um